Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 197, recorded Monday, April 20th, 2015. Code Debugging the Gender Gap. Triangulation is brought to you by Trunk Club. Have the wardrobe you've always dreamed of handpicked by your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash twit and join Trunk Club today for free. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you get award-winning financial tools, unbiased advice, and a transparent view of all your investments. That's well, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and talk about big subjects. So glad you're here uh, today because this is a very important subject for all of us. The subject, sometimes I think guys in technology go, ah, we poo-poo. It is not something to poo-poo. And this movie will, I think, bring that all home. We're talking with a producer and a director of a new documentary called Code, Debugging the Gender Gap. It made its debut last night at the Tribeca Film Festival, and we're so glad to have its uh, director, Robin Hauser Reynolds, with us today. Robin, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Very important subject, and one that's near and dear, I think, to... An interesting thing is starting to happen in Silicon Valley with the release of information about hiring, about how many women and how many uh, minorities are working at these big Silicon Valley companies, I think a lot of eyes have opened. But we've all known for a long time that women and girls are often discouraged from math or discouraged about getting into uh, computing and technology. Uh, we share one thing in common, we have college-age daughters. Mm -hmm. Was your daughter the inspiration for this film? She was, actually. So my daughter was um, at her sophomore year in college, and she was studying computer science. And she's always been a really confident girl academically. But she called home and she said, um, Mom, this is, this is bad. I'm like one of two girls in a class of 35. And, uh, you know, I, she goes, they all know so much more. She goes, the guys have been doing this forever. They know so much more about it. And these are, at, you know, prerequisite classes, but, but early stage classes. And um, it, I, think it, I think it makes it tough. You know, she's a tough girl. She's a D1 athlete. Um, but by the time she got to her third level class and there still was a you know, very poor showing of women and, and not a lot of mentors, right? Not a lot of people to go to for help and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue, but she eventually, yeah, she, she actually called home one day and said, I'm, I'm done, I'm out and dropping out. So, and which was disappointing. She's taken two computer science classes since then, which is nice. Um, and now she's, she's looking into computer graphics, but um, It's yeah, discouraging, it, it, I know. Well, it is. I mean, I think what's interesting is that the same time your daughter's calling home, talking about sort of how hard it is to, to get supported in some of these classes in computer science, the Wall Street Journal is saying, hey, grads, you want a job out of college? You know, yeah. hope you studied computer science, right? right? And then this huge supply and demand discrepancy. Um, I thought, what's going on here? This is really interesting. So how did you dig into this topic? How did you, what, where did you begin? Well, I think the first thing I thought was, okay, why aren't women being hired? Right? I mean, why aren't women being hired? And then I realized, well, there actually aren't really enough women to hire. So what's going on with that? Well, there are issues with the pipeline. There are mm -hmm. issues with um, you know, education. Mm -hmm. But we then started going all the way back and realized that a lot of it has to do with culture and stereotype. We have a real issue with the stereotype of a computer science programmer in this country. And I think when you were talking about talking about this issue, you know, when you talk Wait, about something... Right on the front as, page of your trailer, I just want to say this. Yeah. The, probably one of the most decorated and uh, esteemed computer programmers of all time, uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. She's a she woman. <laughs> yeah, she is. Well, that's the thing. So Gloria Steinem says that women have always been an equal pa part of the past, but not an equal part of history. Yes. And how true is that? How many yes. people know who Grace Hopper is? How many people right. know who Ada Lovelace is? Right. And in fact, the first people to work with computers and computing machinery were women. 
Um, in well, fact, that's exactly right. I believe the word computer actually referred to a female person at first. Uh, so uh -huh. <laughs> That's fascinating. That's yeah. a fact I didn't know. But I'll tell you that Ada Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter. Right. She wrote the first algorithm, right? right. Uh, Grace Hopper, who you see right there, yeah. was actually she actually coined the term debugged because they found she was working on the Harvard Mark I and they found a moth in the, in the vacuum that was um, making the computer not work right. So there aren't a lot of people that know those things. The ENIAC women helped break the German war code. Yeah, if you watch the uh, movie about, the somewhat flawed movie uh, about uh, Alan Turing, uh, th there are a lot of women doing the work of decoding the Enigma machine. Um, yeah. And then, of course, the guys come in and say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> out of the way, ladies. <laughs> yeah, so, well, it's been an interesting transgression, right? I mean, from sort of um, it being a woman's job, a lot yeah. of the, the, the coding and stuff was a woman's job, to um, these days being very few. There were more women in 1984 in computing than there are now. Wow. And yet online and in social media and using technology, of course, it's, it's, it's as it is in the real world, it's a 50-50 thing. In fact, there may even be more women online. Oh, absolutely. I think some of these companies where, you know, if you talk about Twitter or Airbnb is a good example, um, you know, their numbers are no better, no worse. They definitely have female engineers and they're working hard to get more, but they're probably around 18 percent or so. Yeah. And yet their user base is the majority women. Yeah. We're talking to Robin Hauser uh, Reynolds, the producer and director of a new uh, documentary. You debut called uh, Code. Um, and debugging the gender gap. I love that subtitle. Uh, you debuted last night at, Tri at the Tribeca Film Festival. How was, what was the response? How was the reaction? It was, it was amazing. I mean, it was really remarkable. We sold out, so I think we sold over 475 nice. seats, or, you know, yeah. the, the film festival did. And in fact, four out of our, all the screenings, I think for, we may have a handful left for, for Tuesday's screening. But um, it was wonderful. I've gotten a lot of emails today from, um, Interesting, and from law offices, from um, young women in tech, from men, people just saying thank you so much for shedding the light on the subject. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this to the forefront. So this has been really re rewarding. We're gonna have more with uh, uh, Robin in just a second on triangulation. But first I have to talk to you about my lovely wardrobe. You may have noticed what a snappy dresser I've become and I owe it all to another Robin. Robin, my stylist at Trunk Club. Let's open, I got a new trunk. Let's open the trunk today. The idea of Trunk Club is such a great idea. You pay nothing. You talk to a personal stylist, she or he will put together, based on your interests, your clothing styles, a whole bunch of stuff. They'll actually put it up on a website first. Once you approve it, they send it along for you to try on. At this point, you have still spent, at, oh, I like this. What do you think? I think, I think Robin wants me to go lumberjack on her. I feel, I feel like that. Although it's interesting, this has a spread collar. This is beautiful clothing from uh, top designer brands. Here's an art from Jeremy Argyle, New York. Beautiful merino wool. Oh, the feeling on that. Uh, she knows me. She knows I love the cable nets. I told her a lot of sweaters because uh, it's chilly here in Petaluma, even in the summertime. We get a little bit of that. About so the idea is you're going you're gonna to get this trunk. you got 10 days to try it on. Take out the stuff you want, the stuff that fits. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm zoomed in a little bit here. Take out the stuff you want, the stuff that fits, and then send the rest back. And then and only then will you get a bill. Only for the stuff you keep. The beautiful part about Trunk Club is there's no subscription. It's not going to come every month. It's not one of those things you forget and suddenly there's a pile of clothes on your door. It's so much better than that. Trunk Club is an amazing idea that has really transformed my look, no guy wants to go shopping, let's face it, unless it's shopping for tools. See, talk about a gender, <laughs> a gender role, but it, it's kind of true. At least I don't like to go clothes shopping, but Robin has made this so much easier. She's my personal stylist. They get to know your preferences, your style, your fit, your schedule, your lifestyle, and at each trunk you get gets better and better and better, but you only get a trunk when you say, send me another one. You're busy, maybe you hate shopping like I do, make it easy, rely on your own personal stylist and trunk club to do the work for you. You'll get great clothes, hand-picked for your style, and you can sign up now, free, trunkclub.com slash twit. You'll meet your stylist and get your first trunk of fabulous clothes. And all of this is free until you buy the clothes. Trunkclub.com slash twit. By the way, they, I didn't get any shoes today, but I've got some great shoes. 
Yeah, sh shirts, shoes, slacks, jeans, belts, jackets. She sent me a pocket square, a necktie, just some great stuff. Trunkclub.com slash twit. Try it today. Our guest, uh, Robin uh, Hauser Reynolds, is the uh, producer and director and creator of a brand new documentary, Code Debugging the Gender Gap. She's joining us now after a big party in New York City <laughs> celebrating the release of the movie last night at the Tribeca Film Festival, which is, uh, that's actually just getting invited to that film festival is a big deal, so congratulations. Getting in, apparently there were 6,000 submissions wow. this year, so I wow. felt incredibly honored to be part of that, to be, uh, to be able to, to screen here at Tribeca. It's a good feather in our cap. So you mentioned when you began um, that it, it, the hiring wasn't the issue as much because there are fewer candidates, so you have to go back earlier. Where do you start? Oops. Um, Hello. Don't, sorry. <laughs> Already the call's pouring in. Yeah. Hey, is, if it's Louis B. Mayer, take it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I already got invited to the New York City uh, City Hall. Oh, they nice. They have a uh, they have a female com um, chief technology officer, so they nice. heard that I was in town, and that was that was a thrill. It's beautiful. That's really good. Um, yeah. Sorry, remind me of your question. <laughs> you, where do we start? It doesn't start obviously once you enter the workplace. It has to start earlier than that. Does it start in grade school? I actually think it starts when we're bringing girls home in pink blankets and boys home in blue blankets from the hospital, yeah. to be honest with you. I think but you know, as a parent, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong, I have a boy and a girl. There are some gender differences. We're not, we're not uh, denying that there are differences between boys and girls. I'm certainly not denying that there are differences no. between boys and girls, but I'm, I, I, I know from the scientists that we've talked to that there is no innate difference in a male or female brain that enables one to be a better coder than the other, or that, better programmer. And you start and out with math, that. The, the Har Harvard professor, former Harvard president, Larry Summers, uh, very, very bad thing for him to say. It, it, it said there was an innate difference between men and women in terms of Yeah, I mean, science. really, the, you know, honestly, that was a pretty risky thing for him to say. I mean, this was a few years ago, but he, he did say that, and I think it offended a lot of people. There was sort of a firestorm that came up after that. But but um, but I think that there's some uh, somewhat of, of, of unconscious bias the way we even as parents. I mean, if I were to start all over again, I think I'd do it a little differently myself. But we tend to sort of track our girls and track our boys. We let boys stay on computers longer. Yeah. We try to get the girls to come into the kitchen to bake cookies, um, probably more than we do with our boys. Um, engineering toys, especially, you know, you walk down the toy aisle and they're all girl, the girls' aisles, they're all pink and frilly. And um, the boys are the ones that are sort of more building blocks, Legos, right. that type of thing, right? Right, although we have a sponsor, Little Bits, which is doing an amazing thing, and I think making it accessible to everybody. I think there's a, you see, see come, we've interviewed Lady Ada uh, from Ada Fruit, and, uh, and I mean, here's a women-run uh, company that is, sells pieces so you can make projects, electronics projects. I think we're starting to see at least the goods out there if a parent wishes to take advantage of it. But we have to exactly. raise parents' awareness too. Yeah, well, that's it. It's raising awareness and it's getting them to understand. Codable is a really great one online that, um, Codable with a K, that, that kids, that just help them with the foundations and they don't, it's, they've taken the syntax out of it. So kids don't even really need to know how to read and yet they're learning the fundamentals of coding, which is really I mean, cool. Because let me tell you, they, these kids are gonna need to know this. I mean, that it's, it's everywhere, it's not going away, right? right. So our, the, the sort of the foundation of our existence pretty soon is gonna be about coding. That's another point you make in the film, uh, that everybody is going to be in some way doing that. Uh, and uh, I think it is tr I don't know if everybody's going to be typing <laughs> let A no, equals not. three, but I think there's going to be, but you need to know how technology works. And, the, and I think the more people that we have who understand it and can make it, the better. And as, as, a, as an individual, going into life with that skill is going to make a huge difference. And it's well, now's the nice. time to get girls ready so that they don't get left out of this. And not just girls. I mean, we need more girls, we need more boys, we need well, more people of color. Of course. Right, everybody. So there, I mean, I think there are a lot of different, like code is everywhere. It's in our, it's on our phones, it's in our navigation systems, yeah. in our car, it's in the hospitals, right? It's, it's, at the, it's at the base of everything. So I think you're right. Not everybody needs to be a lawyer, not everybody needs to be um, a doctor, but to know something about law, something about medicine, maybe something about, you know, economics is important. And just the way somebody, everybody should know a little bit about computer science. Um, but so I, I, I agree. And the whole idea about having diversity on a coding team is that with greater diversity, they're really able to create products that are going to serve a greater breadth of, of, of society, right, of humanity. 
I mean, well, how good... many more Snapchats do we need, right? right? We need to find out what are the needs out there. And unless you have that sort of perspective on socioeconomic diversity and on needs of, of different people, other than the 25-year-old white male from, you know, Palo Alto, for example, how do you know what products are really being needed out there? It's really a good point. Uh, you, if you look at the hot, so-called hot apps, they're, they're 25 year old men made them. And, uh, yeah. and I think that, uh, you know, it's the same thing in medicine. If you add diversity to the group of people, to the programmers, to the people who are making this, who are designing or thinking about it, uh, then you're, gonna, you're much more likely to get uh, things that appeal to everybody. And what I really hate is, is apps, guys designed for women, because that's, <laughs> that's even worse. You know? Well, and it's interesting. It's not to say that men can't design for women, because I think men can effectively design for women, and I think women can effectively design for men as well. Right. But I think the important thing here is that, and I think it's letting off, as 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 um, uh, Colleen Lewis says very aptly in the film, it's letting men off too easy by saying that they shouldn't be able to think, you know, on a perspective of more outside of just who they are. No, but yeah. we do know that there have been big marketing blunders, right, in the world when there have been a, sort of a shallow perspective at the coding level, like the airbag, for example, that we use in our film. Um, and another one I like to say is the, the, the steps at the Apple store in Chelsea. I don't know if you've seen them, but when they were first built, they were all glass. And um, really cool, beautiful design. But does a woman wearing a skirt want to walk up no. a glass staircase? In, I don't think so. <laughs> so. You know, they've now sort of scratched them so that they're 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 less opaque. You know, they're. But, Jeez, Louise. Yeah. And you're right. I never thought of that. <laughs> uh, maybe if I wore a kilt, I'd be more more likely to be aware of that. So <laughs> we start younger. We start as parents, not uh, not saying, "Oh, uh, she's not going to be interested in um, math." Uh, we've talked. We had a, a great guest to here a couple of weeks ago who does middle school curricula uh, on coding, and uh, I think it's also maybe a, the case that getting schools to uh, embrace coding, not even for people who are pre-professional coders or or job pr preparation, but because it's a, a form of uh, learn teaching form of thinking. We used to teach math for that reason. Uh, and I think that you coding can be used within a math curriculum because it's the same thing. It's rigorous thinking, problem solving, um, you know, uh, you know, weightlifting for the brain that everybody needs, even in a liberal well, arts education. That's exactly right. But I think also, so there's an argument people say, well, how are we going to, what are we going to drop? You know, ancient European history. I mean, no. what do we drop? And does it fit into... Um, is it a math? Is it a science? Is it a language? And the truth is, is that coding needs to be interpreted and in, sort of brought into all the different classes. Yeah. It can be in our English class. It can be in the history class. It can be in the art class, right? As well as the math and the sciences. So um, yeah, our CTO, the chief technology officer of the United States of America, is a wonderful woman named Megan, Megan Smith. Smith yeah. And she's making great effort to, to do this, to bring it in. in. In the UK, it's an obligatory subject in schools. It really needs to be in the United States because technology is moving so much faster than academia right now. And in the United States, we are not keeping up. So by 2020, there's going to be a million unfilled jobs in the US. That's crazy. Yeah. And uh, well, it's good. It means there's a huge opportunity. So the opportunity, but guess what? We're not producing. I mean, the we got to start now. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 going three times. Tech jobs are are making jobs for computer scientists three times faster than we're producing computer scientists in the U.S. Yeah. So guess what? We're opening our doors. That's great. But if we want to, do we want to ship these jobs over to Southeast Asia or to India, or are we gonna, you know, teach our kids how to do this so that they've got these great lucrative jobs? About ninety percent of our audience is male right now. Uh, because we're a technology channel, right? I, you would be doing me a great favor because I would love to have more young women watching this, uh, learning about technology. Uh, we have as you know as many women on the sh on the air as we can because we want to make sure that they understand it's okay to do that. Our very first uh, chief of engineering here, uh, Colleen, was an amazing young woman who, who was one of the biggest geeks I've ever met. So I have no I have no doubt the abilities are there. But what can the men watching uh, do to make this change, to help this change go forward? Well, I think it depends on who exactly the audience is. But if, if, if there are guys out there who are men out there who um, are in a startup 
company, for example, and they're in a hiring position, I think, or, or even if you're just working as a programmer, I think the most important thing is to make sure that your company is um, a comfortable place for a woman to work, right? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, we're sort of done with the whole programmer mentality. That's great. Oh, we get horrible, it. You know, horrible. you guys are cool dudes. But, but I mean, I just think it's really important that, that women feel space in the environment. Um, I, I have to tell you about the female factor. So the female factor is a study that was done at, it was in the Harvard Review, I think it was done at Carnegie Mellon. And it says that regardless of the individual IQ of a group of people, when you add a woman to the team, the collective IQ of the team rises. I love that. <laughs> it's, hey, I'm just saying, okay, just saying. But, but it's true. And I think it's incredibly important to realize also I mean, the effectiveness of teams um, go up greatly. You know that, that when women are involved in investing, and it does better. So, I mean, it's, you know, I, I did not make this up. These are, these are studies that have been done. <laughs> and I think that a lot of men would, would admit that actually it's really fun to it's have better. women on the it's team. It's better. better. Uh, it's it better. steps everything up. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't so want to. So I think that that's one thing that has to, I think that that's one thing that has to happen. And I also think that it's hard to change a stereotype, right? But as long as the stereotype is that a programmer has to be a guy in a hoodie with, you know, glasses eating uh, stale pizza and drinking Red Bull at three in the morning, I don't know a whole lot of women that want to get in that. And what I tried to do with the, with the film, with the documentary, we wanted them to show pe that people don't have to be, first of all, there's nothing wrong with a geek at all. Geeky women, geeky men, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, no, we know, celebrate it. Exactly. It's great. But, there's, but we've also got to show that you can be, you know, uh, an athletic woman, uh, a woman that cares about fashion, and you can still be a computer science programmer, uh, and you can be in an incredibly creative role. Like Danielle Feinberg, who's at Pixar, is in our film. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's amazing. She's a rock star. Mm -hmm. She writes, her team writes the algorithms that control the way light shines off the school of, um, of fish in Finding Nemo. Or the way Merida's hair is, you know, bouncing and brave. I love right? the, really I love cool that animation. stuff that you showed her talking about. Yeah, Merida's it's hair. fun. It's, it's so cool. Great. It can be creative. It can be. You can be in fashion. You can be in medicine. You can be yeah. in all sorts of collaborative things. Being a programmer. Liz in our chat room, who uh, is obviously a woman, uh, said, and and I think this is true. Stop sexualizing. Uh, she says sex is part of the undertone at work and at school, and that becomes a real issue. You know, I was watching um, Mad Men last week. And uh, there is a wonderful scene where two women are presenting to a bunch of male um, executives from a company. And the male executives cannot stop acting like schoolboys and, and, and sexualizing the whole situation it's in, a sh in a way that's so shocking. And yet, as a guy, I'm sitting and watching and cringing, thinking, wow, that, that, <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. And it was very And that's powerful 1960s, scene. right? And that's 60s, so that's but you know 60s, what? It's 60s, it's happening now it's too. Still and happening. It, the, the difference too that's frustrating, which is I think partly why Ellen Powell's case, you know, why she had a tough time with her case. I think it was a really good thing for for the women's movement, but I think it was tough because it's not necessarily blatant sexism anymore. Right. It's little microaggressions. It's death exactly. by a thousand cuts. So it's maybe not being heard when you're, um, you know, in your team or in a meeting or something like that. Yep. It's this. It's not being given the opportunity to advance. So it's not really meritocracy then, for women in tech. And I think that that's it. It gets tiresome, right? Yeah. Every day having to come to work proving that you deserve to be there. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think guys aren't as sensitized uh, to it. We we had a book group for a while, and uh, and women the women in the group finally said we're not going to let guys come anymore because you guys talk in your loud voices and dominate the conversation and we are effectively shoved aside and it's not something any of the guys meant to do it but it does happen and uh, just raising this awareness i think watching the film is a great way to to do that we're talking uh, with the producer and a director of a brand new film uh, about this issue about the issue of gender in uh, in technology it's called coding debugging uh, the gender gap and you can find out more at coding let's see code just code code debugging the gender gap code not coding there's there's the first mistake uh is it what is the website is it code doc code, co? well, code documentary code documentary.com will get you there. okay let's good let's use that code documentary.com uh and so you can find out more there's a trailer there you can see more information about it uh, and and uh, find out where you can see it. I'm gonna actually. I'll ask you in a second, Robin, where we can, where we hope to be able to see it. I'd love to see this on Netflix and places like that. Uh, more in a moment.
But first, put on your aprons, guys, because it's time to cook. Blue, a you got your blue apron on? You know what the blue apron comes from? That is uh, the apprentice's aprons at the famous Cordon Bleu Cooking School in Paris. And I think it's a really great choice for blueapron.com. What is blueapron.com? Well, look, you want to eat delicious meals. You don't want to eat out every day. You maybe you probably can't afford to eat out every day, and it's not good for you. So what about cooking amazing gourmet meals? There's the Blue Apron box shipped to you. It's refrigerated, uh, not frozen, though. I want to point out with all the ingredients you need and just the right amount. See, just the right amount of parsley, just the right amount of peppers, just the right amount of spinach, uh, I, lettuce. What, what are we going to make? Shiitake mushrooms. Oh, Greek yogurt. This is Jason. And a little tilapia? Are you going to make some? I think he's going to make a fish dish. Blue Apron menus are never repeated. Shawarma knickknacks. <laughs> Black beluga lentils. All fresh, all picked fresh, freshly produced uh, from local farms, then shipped directly to you. Every meal is balanced, five to 700 calories, uh, and they're so yummy. I, you have several. What are you got three meals in there. Okay, crispy chicken thighs. See, they give you these great recipe cards with pictures so you know exactly. You don't have to be a great cook to make a Blue Apron meal, but I tell you, you will become a... Oh, I want the tilapia munier. That sounds phenomenal. We're going to get Jason cooking right now. Look at that. Everything you need. Now, the, the really great thing is now you know how to cook this. Keep those uh, cards. It, you're going to actually create a Blue Apron cookbook. They also are online if you want to get the recipes online. And it is fantastic. You will, everybody will suddenly say, wow, you're a great cook. Date night coming up. You're going to love it. They have family plans with ingredients that are perfect for picky kids. How about spring casserole with fennel, asparagus, and golden raisins? Piri piri chicken with coconut smashed plantains and stewed collard greens. Incredible stuff. You'll never get the same meal twice. They'll work with your schedule so you don't have to worry about a box being left on your doorstep when you're not home. Date night cooking with friends. This is, by the way, that'd be a lot of fun. Just get that all prepared and cook it out with friends. What are you going to make? What are you making there? Is that the lamb? Uh, this is the uh, falafel. It's oh. a lamb falafel, and it was phenomenal. Oh, it was so good. I love this, Jason. Yeah, it was really good. You know, even if you've never cooked before, this gives you the confidence to be a great cook. Exactly. And man, your, your friends and family will flip their lids. It's about $10 a meal. So it's a very affordable, much better than eating out, and much more helpful, frankly. So check out this week's menu. Get your first two meals free. Oh, Jason, I'm coming to your house. What do you know? I'm a cook. Holy cow, that looks good. <laughs> nice job. Blueapron.com slash twit. My mouth is watering. Blueapron.com slash twit. Your first two meals free. They're waiting for you, and we thank them so much for their support of Triangulation. Our guest... And I'm very glad to have her, the director of a brand new documentary called Code, Debugging the Gender Gap, Robin Hauser Reynolds, director and producer. Uh, and credit, uh, we should probably give credit to um, your co-producer, uh, Stacey Hartman, as well, yes? Absolutely, we should give credit to all of our team. Stacey, Stacey Hartman, John Bloomgren, Christy Herring, you see Christy Herring there. Our editor is amazing. Jack Youngelson is our um, story consultant. Um, and I love it that Molly's uh, Molly's picture is a pic is a drawing because she's with design and animation. I love that she is, and I have to tell you something that make that picture makes her look ancient. She's actually <laughs> absolutely gorgeous and young and youthful, and it's really pretty and, funny. And there's yes. another example: if you're gorgeous, young, and youthful, maybe you don't want to put your picture out there on the internet because you just attract negative attention. Who knows who you attract, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a I shame. don't have that issue. Let's make that safe. <laughs> Actually, there's yeah, already somebody in the chat room who has a crush on you, so you do, Robin. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's let's make that safe, uh, guys. Really, we got to make it safe uh, for women to participate in this. It's you know, okay. So this is an interesting thing. I'm just going to ask you this about Leo because, so there's been a term that's been going around a lot lately, which is unconscious bias, right? Yes. Is sexism in the startup culture in the workplace unconscious bias? Yes. And I was on a panel with Kara Swisher the other day, and she says basically, screw that, right? I mean, come on, it's it's not unconscious, it's conscious, and you guys just figure this out. You guys change your ways. You know. You know when you're being, when your tendencies are misogynistic, you know when you're not being super, you know, friendly or whatever. I mean, the guy's jokes are, you know, the pornography on the website that's going around in, in mm -hmm. her office and that type of thing. Now, now, I'm not a woman in tech. I'm a filmmaker, so I haven't lived that, but I've been hearing a lot about it. Um, 
I think I will also tell you that there are a lot of male allies, right? I know a lot of men in tech that care about this issue that want to make a change too. So uh, this is not a whiny female film. I, 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 I'm not. not a man hater. I love men. Yeah. I, it's just, I think it's really an interesting situation that's happening. Um, but I think the sort of boys club in tech has got to change if we're going to make the environment and, and frankly, the products better for everybody, I right? I agree. I think, I understand Kara's point. And Kara's a good friend of the, uh, Kara's been on the shows many times, a good friend of the shows. She's, she's, so, she's great. Great. <laughs> she's uh, great. And uh, her point is, you say unconscious, it lets you off the hook. So no more of that passing the buck. Oh, I, it's unconscious. I didn't know. Um, make it conscious <laughs> and then stop doing it. And I completely agree with her. Um, yeah, exactly. And guess what? You know, if you're 22 year old and just new in startup or something, then you know, you know very well, right? Because you're not, I mean, if somebody in their 50s, I mean, if somebody's got a nickname for different ethnicity or something and it's because they're 77 years old and they fought in, you know, the Korean War, okay, that's one thing. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But sorry, now, I mean, if you're in tech, it's, it's not okay. Make room for the women, make room for people of color because we need them. Right. We all need them. Well, I think that you're really hitting the right angle, which is it's in your interest. It's not because it's the right thing to do. I mean, it is the right thing to do, but also it it's in your interest to do this. It's in all of our interest to do this. Right. It's in all of our interest to do this. I mean, truly, tech is here to stay. Um, it's, it's moving incredibly fast. There are amazing products out there. And, um, but we need to serve a greater a greater depth of humanity. And I think that we can do that once we get, um, you know, greater perspective at the coding level. Right. But we just need to fill these jobs too, right? I mean, yeah. that's huge. We gotta fill these jobs. I think of people uh, like Kara Swisher, like Colleen, uh, the hardcore geek women uh, that I've known, um, uh, they did it in spite of the biases and being the only woman in the class or the only woman in the lab or the only woman uh, in the in the company, uh, and they just they kind of said, "Screw that! I'm just going to do it because I love it." And I'm going to. I think of Jerry Ellsworth, uh, who uh, is an amazing creator and inventor, and she just you know it's not. Of course, I'm sure she's aware of this, and I'm sure it hurts, but but it's a sad statement that the only people right now we have are people who are so forceful they just pushed through it anyway. Well, I think that's right. There, there's definitely a type of woman that makes, you know, I used to be, a, I used to sell IPOs, um, you know, in London. I was actually working in, for Nomura Securities in, in Luxembourg. And uh, listen, that was a really a male dominated Boys industry, book. right? Yep. Of course it was. Oh yeah, absolutely. I didn't let it deter me. I loved what I did. It was, it was super fun. You know, um, I'm now a female director of films. There aren't a whole lot of us, right. but someone asked me the other day, what's it like to be a female director? I said, I've never been anything but a female director, so I don't know what it would be like to be a male director, you know? For me, it's great. I'm having a Must lot of fun. Must be fun. fun. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's okay. But, I, but, but the problem is, is that if, if we can't retain women in the space, which is beginning to happen, and that's a whole different story, right? That has to do with, you know, the microaggressions, yes. It also has to do with childcare and, and sort of mm. what are we doing to get women back in? So, you know, mm. for, for now, anyways, women are the only people that can have children. So if you want to have children, then let's find a way to make that work and, and retain them in the workforce. And that's, that's a huge issue that I think that, that we all need to start focusing on as well. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I think you're right. You know, I think right now to work in a male dominated industry, you have to have a certain amount of armor around you. Yeah. You have to be willing to put up with a certain stuff or you just have to have blinders on and charge forward. Yeah. Um, so we need, it would be great to, for everybody to, to make the environment a little bit more comfortable for women yeah. and, and people of color. Yeah. And I'm sure it has a, a cost for those people as well who, who are forced to do that. You know, the person who runs our company, our CEO, uh, is a, came from uh, the construction industry, which was absolutely a boys club. And she, she learned to be a CFO in an environment where she was probably the only woman, except for secretaries, uh, and constant sexism uh, and sexist comments and stuff. And that's exactly what she had to do. And by the way, I, I married her. Uh, so I know a little bit about her personal uh, story with that. And it, it's toughened her. And um, I think that, that we shouldn't have, people shouldn't have to be toughened so that they can w make a living and work, guys. Uh, Elizabeth also in our chat room is saying, uh, don't forget, this isn't, this is about your daughters. This is about uh, your wives. This is about uh, uh, 
people you care a lot about and making the, place, the world a more equitable place for them. Um, is there something we can do in schools, you think, to make this better? Oh, absolutely. I think the first thing uh, that we can do in schools is, is to stop telling people, well, you're either you know, left-brained or right-brained, or, well, that's okay, you know, you might not be great with algebra, you're a really good writer, or you're probably just more artistic, you know, on that side. I mean, I remember being told that in, call, in, in what, probably like fourth grade or something. So therefore, when I got to a particularly difficult you know, algebra problem in high school, I remember thinking, oh gosh, okay, well, I'm not supposed to be good at this, so that's okay. Whereas if I get stuck writing a paper, I'll work, you know, my derriere off to, to, to keep at it to write a really good paper. And um, if I put that same effort into, into, you know, calculus or whatever, I'm sure I would have done really well. But when we're constantly being told, well, you're not supposed to do this, you know, it's working against you anyway, you're just probably not going to be good at science or you're not going to be good at math, which is unfortunately what we're constantly telling our girls. And the truth is, is that they are as good. Women have, girls have every, they are just as good. But in seventh and eighth grade, girls stop raising their hands, especially in co-ed education, right? So they don't want to be the smart girl. They don't want to be sort of the geeky girl. They want to be the popular girl and the cool girl. And I think that that is very cultural. That's very, it happens in other countries also, but that's very American. And that's pretty sad, right? I mean, that's really pretty sad. So we need to instill confidence in our daughters and our nieces and our sisters. Um, and we need to, you know, really make it so that the school system changes such that the teachers are, are really encouraging every girl to say, you can do whatever you want. You can be good at all subjects. You can be good at whatever you set your mind to. There's also a certain amount of tone deafness, I think, uh, among not just men, but women, let's face it, women too, who uh, say, oh, I don't see a problem. Oh, there's no problem. Oh, girls don't get into the math and science and coding because they're not interested. Uh, this is normal. This is, what are you worried about? You're making this, you're making this all up. Uh, how do you know you're not making this all up? Well, um, so look, I, th I think at the base of this, one of the biggest problems is there are no role models, right? There are very, very few role models. So if a girl can't see that she, well, who do we think about when we think right. about, you know, men in tech? We're thinking about Steve Jobs and Wozniak. And I mean, if you cannot um, see yourself or see women or people that look like you, right? The old, the old, the old verbiage, you cannot be what you cannot see. I think it's really hard. I mean, think about a young African-American man or woman. How, who do they have to look toward to think, well, I can do this? I mean, there's a wonderful woman that started an organization called um, Black Girls Code, Kimberly Bryant, and she's a fabulous role model. I think having Megan Smith in the White House is a really big deal, and that's, she's doing amazing things to inspire young girls. Um, but it, we need more role, role models. And so we can, do, we can have role models within a company too, right? But there's got to be somebody in your company that a woman or that a person of, of really any gender and, and any ethnicity and any socio socioeconomic group can go to and turn to if they're feeling like they're not being supported in that environment. Yeah. And um, I think that that's really important. If it really is the case that it's possible to say, as Larry Summers said, oh, women just are innately not good at this. And if you don't have a bunch of women you could point to who are good at it, uh, of course, there's a certain amount of uh, 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 blindness saying that because there are women who are very good at it. But the more role models you have, the more people you can point to and say, well, obviously women have an ability to do this because look at Marie Curie or uh, you know, look at Grace Hopper. Um, and the more you can do that, the more difficult it's going to be to promulgate that uh, uh, ridiculous uh, notion that there's some innate inability to do it. That's, uh, and you, you blast that away right away at the beginning of the movie. And I think well, that that's yes. true. I mean, yeah. phew, right? Of course. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Obvious. I, don't, <laughs> I, can't even think, I don't even think Larry Summers believed it when he said it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of how ingrained this is in our brain that those words could come out of his mouth um, and, and the issue is the word innate, um, you know, uh, is it, is it impossible for uh, a girl to become a coder or to become a scientist 
or to become a Well, okay, so let's, let's then talk about how important it is for um, people to be able to see more people like that. Like, let's take the television show um, Silicon Valley, right? Oh, what a how great many, example. <laughs> okay, but, right at, but how, many, how many women engineers do we see there? Mm. We don't see any. And then we, I mean, in fact, we use two clips of it. We, we, we claim fair use, and we use two clips in the film um, where they talk about, you know, the kind of bro you need to be to make this, you know, to make this startup work, right? Um, and there, there, there are no women. In it. They talk about, you know, it's be tough, dude. You know, don't be a nice guy. We'll never be successful. Right. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think that that Hollywood has a lot to do with this too. Let's start seeing, you know, women heroines that are um, scientists, that are, you know, the computer savvy women. I mean, let's let's get them out there in films, in television in books, I mean, that'll make a big difference with changing our stereotype. It, it, it can take a, a century or, you know, it can take what, what a generation is what Claude Steele says. It can take a generation to change a stereotype. I think that would be fast. But I think that um, that's incredibly important. Gosh, and it. so we can do that by, you know, by getting into our media too, pop yeah. culture. Absolutely. Um, CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, very famously said, uh, he said it foolishly at a conference uh, for women in computing uh, that women should just shouldn't ask for raises. This is this is a perfect example of I think unconscious bias, but I think also Kara Swisher is right. Maybe he should be made conscious of it. He was that women shouldn't have to ask for raises. Just shut up, be quiet, and do good work, and we'll know, and we'll give you a raise. <laughs> he said, "Leave it to karma." <laughs> Leave it to and karma. I yeah, he said, leave it to karma. I, I, you know, I mean, boy, let me tell you, I, that was at the Grace Hopper uh, celebration, I believe. And, and I mean, I've heard some pretty crazy things. I've also heard um, some comments made when I actually felt as though the man that made it didn't mean it the way it was received. Right. But he certainly should have been a lot more careful. Right. And uh, Alan Eustace was up on stage at a male ally panel at Grace Hopper. And um, he said, somebody from the audience, and it was a pretty frothy audience of women, right? But he said, somebody said, you know, how do women, what do women need to do to be taken seriously, to be taken as, as equal uh, in the tech industry? And Alan Eustace of, of Google said, um, I think he calls himself chief of knowledge, or he's titled chief of knowledge at Google. He yeah. says, you know, um, try harder. Oy. And I mean, you could hear the gasp in the audience. You know, try harder, try harder than what? Try harder than the men? Why should I have to try harder than my coworkers? I mean, we're there and we're trying and we're making every right. effort. So why do we need to try harder, right? right? I mean, that's, it's, it's crazy. And I don't think he really knew, boy, the backlashing after that from him. And I, you know, I, he well, didn't. Well, we all need our, look, I'm a guy. We all need our consciousness raised. Yes. Um, and then in both those cases, the flaw was, it's your fault, ladies. Uh, you need to do something differently than we do. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I as a guy, you, I make a lot... You know what the truth is? You guys need to change. Sorry we, for interrupting. Bad, but the truth bad is, news. You guys need to change. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's where the no, change has got to happen. I agree 100%. Um, what, what do you say to guys who say, but gosh, I feel like it's a minefield. I can't, I, I can't say well, anything. I understand that. I understand that. So you know what? I think there needs to be some sort of, I mean, this is where the training needs to be, right? I mean, this is where, the, I think, listen, I, I believe in having a sense of humor. I fully believe in having a sense of humor. I think that women need to have a sense of humor. I think that men need to have a sense of humor. Um, but there's a fine line, right? And, and again, I am not a woman in tech, but I'm a woman that's been in a male-dominated industry for, for a long time in different male-dominated industries. And I think that, I, I Here's the other problem. I think in startup culture, there's a lot of gray area now, right? What startup company have you gone into that doesn't have a bar right there? Drinking is allowed any time of day, come in at noon, work till 3 a.m., you know, when maybe the mom or, you know, woman in the group who just have a mom wants to come in at 8 and leave by 4 to go pick up her kid from school. But there's this culture of, you know, the pool tables down there and the foosball and the keg that's tapped constantly in the really cool bar. So... I think it's confusing. I think it's confusing to a lot of young men that get out of college and are sort of out of the fraternity system and suddenly are in tech and, well, where does the socializing start and stop and where is it the work day? And I think for women, you wanna come into work and work 
And it's kind of hard when you're not sure which part of this is the social side or which part is the, and it's, am I making sense? I yep. mean, I think it's very confusing. I think though that what this is, is it's like a slow, it's like a train starting from the station. It's slow at first. And the, and the real movement's going to happen as you get more and more women in the workplace. It starts with girls and getting them comfortable with this and saying, you can do this. Don't, you know, and telling the boys at the same time, shut up. <laughs> She's not any less adept at this than you are. Embrace her presence. We got a slow moving train, but at that, it starts there and it can, and then it will filter up. And once you have equality in the workplace, equal pay, equal uh, number of women represented in, in the, in the C level offices, in the boardrooms, um, I think that then it handles itself because the women go, well, sh what are you saying? Are you insane? I am trying. <laughs> What do you try? Yeah. You know, I, one of my one of my favorite uh, characters in, in our film um, is a young woman named uh, Julianne Horvath, who had sort of the, the famous um, uh, exit from GitHub. And yes. I remember asking her once um, in an interview, you know, well, so what can men do? What do men need to do? And she looks at me and, and had a little bit more colorful language than I'll use here. But she basically said, just get the heck out of the way. Right. Yeah. Just tell men to just get the heck out of the way because we're coming and um, I, I love that, you know, and, and I actually think that it it's get out of the way and let women into the space and then let's work together and let's work together and create some really amazing things. Love it. Right. And moms and dads, let's bring your daughters and sons to maker spaces and hacker spaces. Give them tools at home, give them little bits, whatever it is, so that they can uh, have the opportunity uh, to. If, it's such an exciting area and your mind just I mean. Admittedly, not everybody is cut out for this, male or female. But if, but I would guess just as many girls are cut out for this as boys. Give them the tools to discover this, and you may be amazed uh, at what happens. Uh, uh, we're going to have more with uh, our guest. We're talking about a new movie. It's uh, just out. It debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City last night. The big film festival. Code debugging the gender gap. Robin Hauser Reynolds, its producer and directors, our guest. Final words in just a moment. First, let's talk about money. Money has no gender bias, but uh, you have to take care of it. I hope, I'm, I'm sure you are, because you're smart. You're saving for your future. You're planning for retirement, the rainy day, maybe your first house. And I hope you're paying attention to things like the fees, the hidden costs that your broker or the, or the online brokerage is charging you, or maybe your mutual fund loads. Do you even know what a load is? See, this stuff is so important. And if you're saving for something, a retirement, say, and you've got high load mutual funds, it's just slicing years off it, literally years off it. That's why I love personal capital. The personal capital is really three things in one. The first service, absolutely free, is a dashboard to tell you your net worth, where your money is, how your money's being handled, and where money may be leaking away with high fees, hidden costs, mutual fund loads, things like that. It's free, it's secure, already 700,000 investors like you are using personal capital just for that, absolutely free. They're managing their wealth, they're growing their wealth, they're eliminating high fees, they're budgeting, they're doing all the things that dashboard gives you. It's hard to do this otherwise because everything's in a different account with a different password. This puts it all together. Absolutely secure, very easy to use. They use Yodely in the background. I asked Bill about that. Uh, Yodely is the service that banks use as well, so basically, uh, you're just giving permission for Yodely to pass that information to uh, personal capital as well as to your bank. Completely secure. Now, that's part one. Part two is if you're tracking accounts worth $100,000 or more, you probably will be. You'd be surprised how much your net worth actually is. You're going to get a free 30-minute review with a, uh, a personal capital financial advisor, not working on commission. It's absolutely free. You can discuss your financial goals, your tolerance for risk, that's very important. Your time horizon, how long before you retire. You can, this is the way to start that retirement right. If you're 20 years old, 25 years old, 30 years old right now, and you're just getting started, it will make such a difference if you start it right, right now. And this 30 minute call is exactly what you need. Somebody really smart will say, okay, this is how it works. This is what you do. This is how you balance it. This is how much is in stocks, how much is in bonds. This is where you, what you look at. And it's free for th free. Now, you can then the third part, of course, is use personal capital as an as a uh, you know an online brokerage. They do that as well, but that's not a requirement. 
absolutely free to do all of this. No obligation. Get that portfolio consultation. And all you have to do for that is to link $100,000 or more in assets. Very easy to do. And I can tell you right now, the results will benefit you for the rest of your life. The sooner you get started, the better. Personal, at least get the dashboard. Personalcapital.com slash triangulation. You know what? Let's say you do the dashboard. You got $25,000 in assets. Okay, you're not going to get that free call, but you are going to get the information you need to turn that 25 into 100, into 500, into a million. Personalcapital.com slash triangulation. Do not put it off. Do it today. Our guest is Robin Hauser Reynolds. She's the producer and director of a really, I, I, I cannot recommend this film more highly, uh, Code, Debugging the Gender Gap. I was fortunate because I was provided with a uh, online, a secret, I'm not, don't ask me for an online link. <laughs> how do we get the, how do we get this film out? Is going to the film festivals the first step in getting uh, distribution? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll have distribution. We already have interest in distribution. Good. So it will be, it will be distri distributed. That's, that's, um, that that we know for certain and it just takes it takes a little bit of time because right now we're on the film festival circuit um we can't have wide distribution you know if we're on the festival circuit and festivals are are fun it's a great way to um to get the film out it's fun for the for the coding team but it's a great way for the for the directors and producers and, and editors and part of the team to sort of in, enjoy having made the film um Educational distribution is a really important thing to me, so to all of us on the code team. So we will absolutely um, make this, you know, film available to colleges, um, universities, and institutions. I'd also, I'm, I'm looking for for funding now. We're going to bring it down to under an hour piece so that we can bring it into high schools. Ah. Um, I think it's really important to have it be something that's maybe 52, 54 minutes. Um, so that'll be great. And and. Again, you know, already um, through email, we're getting all sorts of, of um, requests and inquiries on when can they screen it, how can they screen it. And then, and then there'll be distribution, too. It'll be made available for corporations, too, people Good. that want to show this to their, to their companies. Good. Um, and we'll have the international distribution. Um, and then eventually, yes, it'll be on streaming. It'll be hopefully Netflix. It'll be um, all over. We'll look for broadcast, too. So, um, It'll, I'd say probably by this time next year, you'll, it'll be readily available. Good. You'll probably walk into Walmart and get it, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Who knows? Knocking on wood, Robin. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you had a panel after the festival last night. How did that go? The panel was great. I thought it was really interesting. We actually had to, um, you know, finally say, I'm sorry, last question. I mean, I think we Good. could have stayed there another 45 minutes. It was, yeah. it was great. Um, we had executive, an executive from Qualcomm, um, one from GoDaddy, uh, another from Etsy, um, and it was it was moderated by a woman from The Verge, um, Addie Robinson. So it was it was it was excellent. That is one space I think where we're starting to see a lot of women is in the uh, tech blog uh, space, and I'm, I I think that's great. Um, and and you know we a lot of those women end up on our uh, our network as uh, contributors and co-hosts. Um, and I think that's the beginning of, of kind of starting to get the ball rolling a little bit in uh, technology as well. Robin, I wish you luck. I think it's a great film. People want to know more. Can tell us the website again. It's coding. It's code? just, just code, code documentary code com. documentary com. Oh. Uh, there's a trailer there. There's information about the festivals. There are a few screenings in New York still to come. Uh, Bentonville's the next one. Um, I, I, I think this is a message that needs to get out, and I'm so glad you uh, made the movie. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much, Leo. It's been a pleasure. It's been it. really yeah. great. Thanks. Robin Hauser Reynolds, Code, Debugging the Gender Gap. Uh, we all, we, I know, I need to, and we all need to get our consciousness elevated in this area. And it, it benefits everyone. We do triangulation every Monday morning, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC, if you want to watch live. It's great. We had three or four women in the chat room fighting the good fight. Thank you. <laughs> and a couple of guys. Fighting back, of course, as guys are wont to do. The chat room is a big part of this show, so please, if you can, watch live do. Otherwise, on-demand uh, audio and video always available at twit.tv slash TRI. We have it on iTunes. We have everywhere uh, you get your podcasts, your, your uh, mobile device. Uh, and, of course, the Twit apps and all the mobile devices, thanks to our great third-party developers. If you get one of those, you can just subscribe and you won't miss a single episode. And that's how I like it. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.